The Sports Mastery Workbook was created for the student athlete and the parent to work through together. The Sports Mastery Workbook was created for the student athlete and the coach to work through together. It was created in a sense and in a way to bridge the gap in communication between these parties and build a successful relationship dynamic. To learn more, visit sportsmastery.com forward slash workbook or check out the show notes page and click on the link. And now back to the show. You know, one of one of the myths of uh, weight training it used to be and was widely and incorrectly believed would make an athlete slow, stiff and muscle bound qualities, obviously undesirable in an athlete of either sex. Women athletes of the late 19th and early 20th century had, of course, more serious problems to contend with than the myth of muscle binding. They were hindered in their pursuit of athletic achievement by a general societal concern for defeminizing for the defeminizing impact of sports, as well as by the medical community's belief that strenuous sports interfere with women's reproductive capacities. In a 1925 newspaper interview with Dr. Thomas D. Wood, director of physical education at Columbia University, reveals this typical mindset. And I quote, whether girls are engaged in social diversions or outdoor exercises, the first thought that they should have is the preservation of safety, health and well-being. The cherishing of that quality of of womanliness which is the chief attraction and finest attribute of women. He continued, they must not overexercise and they should not take part in any game requiring vigorous effort. This goes back to the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s where women were pretty much, they couldn't play basketball. They couldn't play, they couldn't compete in track and field. And as you guessed it, we're going to be discussing strength training for the female athlete. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing why is there such a stigma when it comes to strength training with female athletes? What are the strength training guidelines when it comes to comes to training female athletes? Is the female strength training program different from that of males? What can be done to make strength training more acceptable with female athletes? And finally, we'll discuss nutrition and barring and depending on where we're, where we are with time, we'll address the question. We'll address the question. Are there psychological aspects to consider when training female athletes? Have my co-host on Sean Jenkins onto the show. Sean, I know we've, we've been discussing this for a while. Strength training for, for the female athlete. I know you've done an, an extensive amount of research. What are some of your thoughts on training, on the strength training for the female athlete? Well, the uh, the, the first thing I, I will say is there there is no clear cut difference on how you want to train a male or a female. It's not that I have a program for the female. I have a program for the male because if you look at sports performance overall, as you mentioned earlier, you want power, strength, speed, quickness, and agility. So those are all aspects uh, desired uh, when when uh, engaged in athletics. Uh, so there is no no different, but there are certain nuances, uh, things that you want to pay attention to when training a female athlete because we are uh, you know biologically different. Uh, and, and in some aspects, we're physiologically different. So there are certain things that and that's just the nature of of, of who we are, and how God made us. So we need to uh, address some of those things. But, uh, you know, first, first of all, we need to look at the uh, the historical aspects of uh, when we train in training a, a female athlete. And actually, it didn't matter if it's a female or male athlete. Uh, they all like you mentioned earlier, they were all some of the people, uh, the common uh, uh, the, the common thought was that uh, strength training would, would make an athlete slow, stiff, and muscle bound, and not be able to uh, move very quickly in their sports. And but ever since then, through research and and just by the simple fact that we see it uh, pretty much almost every day, that that is not true. So you know, not only female athletes dealt with it, but the male athletes and coaches uh, did not want their players lifting weights. I remember back in high school, for me, I, w- I would hear that. You know, oh, don't lift weights. It'll, it'll throw off your jumper or or make you, you know, swing your bat slower. I, I, I distinctly remember that. So it wasn't that long ago that some of these uh, fallacies still existed. But um, 
So like, if we go back and look at the, the history uh, of uh, females in sports, um, as you mentioned, you know, there was a stigma for women uh, to participate in sports alone, let alone strength training, uh, basically because of the reprodu- reproductive system. Uh, I remember in graduate school, uh, one of my professors was was we was having a discussion and they actually thought that, you know, it, their, <laughs> their, uh, their, um, I guess your, their reproductive system could actually fall out. I remember him talking about that. that was, <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. He goes, yeah, that was some of the thought that you would damage it. And so, uh, they didn't believe women should, should strength train. But, uh, and this was a, common view of uh, physicians, some scholars and coaches. So, you know, they just didn't have women engaged uh, too much in in sports. And like you said, vigorous activity. And we know uh, uh, weight training can can be vigorous uh, with the uh, the, there's the volume, the amount of volume you have to uh, deal with uh, when you're working. Uh, But Going back to the uh, you know early 20th century, there was a uh, there were advocates of women in strength training, and one in particular yes. was uh, Dr. Diocletian Lewis. So he was an advocate for for women in strength training. And he was a publisher of the New Gymnastics for Men, uh, Women, and Children, and he advocated using light dumbbells, uh, the Indian clubs that you see now. Uh, that are popularized in magazines and at conferences and weighted wands, which is basically a weighted bar. So he was a proponent and he would, he would write about this in his magazine uh, and it became acceptable. As a matter of fact, it was implemented into uh, uh, some physical education programs uh, in, in, in the Northeast in some of the women's schools. So it was, it was starting to be accepted that uh, women should, uh, should weight train. And I also want to mention uh, Bernard McFadden, who was a publisher of a physical culture magazine. And he made it widely. He also was an advocate and he made it a lot more acceptable. And he was a firm believer in the benefits of exercise for women. So, you know, as in the, in the early times, there were some advocates of women participating in athletics and, and strength training. Uh, but still you had those who did not uh, see that as uh, something that women should do. So, um, you know, you had arguments on both sides. You know, what I, what I appreciate about looking back on it from a historical standpoint, and this is all of history, you, you had certain governing bodies or people in powerful positions that pretty much, they pretty much put down an edict that you should do this or you shouldn't do that. And the majority of people were probably listening to that, but you always had some outliers that will go against the grain. And I, I remember one woman in, in that article in particular, I think her, her last name was Russell, where if you, you could put her up to the women today of like the fitness competitors and with no supplements or anything like that. And with her just working with light barbells, body weight calisthenics, doing gymnastics movements, work, working with the Indian clubs like her, com, her physique would match up today. You know, um, they, it, they some of those early women that went against the grain in terms of strength training, who enjoyed it, who wanted to play basketball, compete in track and field, who were enthused to play in the Olympics. They, they kind of reminded me of Amelia Earhart Mm -hmm. where she was told that she could never fly and flying wasn't for women. It was too dangerous. You could die, but they went on head and did that anyway, you know, to get past those, uh, those mindsets and views at the time. Yeah. Yeah. The lady you were referring to was Ivy Russell, uh, who had the, the he had, had a, a lot of muscularity, and so, like you say, would rival some women today. But you know, I also want to also mention that you know, even though this stuff is, you know, is a uh, I guess uh, 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 it's it's ancient. I mean, compared to now, how, how far we've come. But still today, yes. we still run into this. Uh, you know, and one person I thought about is when they started. Uh, uh, talking about uh, Serena Williams, you know, how powerful yeah. she is, how big and muscular she is. And and then some people in some circles, they were looking at it as, as a negative, but she was dominating the sport of women tennis. And so as even though we've come very, very far in, in this, uh, this thinking, this antiquated thinking, 
there's just still some today who just, you know, still want to make it uh, a negative. I, I've had that before training female athletes where I, I've gotten it from the mom. I've gotten it from the dad. We don't want her. We, we want her to get stronger, but we don't want her to get muscle bound. And I, and I and I tell them there's there's no possible way once she just doesn't have the testosterone, you're probably not spending three to four hundred dollars worth of sup in, in supplements every month. So that's not going to happen. You know, we, we want to use strength training, you know, to make her a better athlete. But then uh, it's going to act as an aid in terms of injury prevention. And then more importantly, I've, I, I've seen the increased confidence. Yeah. You know, I've had a, I've had an eighth grade young girl before she hit ninth grade, you know, um, you know, a PR at clean and 95 pounds and her, her confidence went through the roof yes. and to, and, and, and to this day, her parents still thank me for teaching her how to do things appropriately. And this fall, I think she'll be at a school playing volleyball. I just don't know which one, a division one school. She's a great student, but just seeing the increased confidence is tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it is. I mean, and, and, and even I mean, we talk about, you know, we're talking about athletes now, even just in the general population, uh, you know, when you see the differences that uh, that women uh, experience when they're in, in, uh, involved in a, a strength training program. You know, I have a, uh, a group of ladies I train um, during lunchtime and some of the things that they were able to accomplish where they couldn't accomplish before doing full body push ups where they don't have to do the quote unquote girl push ups on their knees, uh, you know, being able to squat. Uh, one lady uh, the other day, she was at, I think she was giving blood or doing, she was at a doctor's office and the lady touched her back. She goes, wow, you're muscular, <laughs> you know, and, and, and she was, mm -hmm. and she took that as a compliment. She was proud of that comp compliment, whereas probably back in the day, they were like, oh my God, you know, freaking out. But yeah, so uh, it runs the gamut, not only athletes, but just the general population. Yeah, definitely. You know, I've been in the clinic and, I, and I've watched, uh, you know, a woman, you know, past 50 being able to deadlift 225 pounds, being able to clean 135 pounds and still looking clearly feminine, yes. you know, but really enjoying vigorous exercise. You know, one of the things that I want to uh, were you were you going to say something? Yeah, I do, I do. You know, one of the things that I want to go back on and, and uh, is and 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 probably is is part of the issue that we're having now is that uh i remember you know in high school was those, the bodybuilding magazines and so i think a lot of that also played a part when people would look uh at the females because if you look at the wrong female in the bodybuilding magazine they were taking steroids and and doing all kinds of stuff like you alluded right. to and so even though you know we're training athletes and they're not uh, trying to uh, obtain that look through uh, anabolic steroids and whatever other stuff, supplements they want to take, that's still ingrained in people's minds. Uh, that's how a woman looks when she lifts weights. But that is just so far out there because they're doing uh, something in addition to just lifting weights. So that is another thing that we had to battle against uh, when talking to or when trying to encourage female athletes to strength train or talking to their parents or in some cases coaches because some coaches, you know, still believe that, unfortunately. Yes, I, I would say if you're the student athlete, a female student athlete listening to this or if you're a sports parent, it's OK. You want you want your young daughter into strength training to to become a better athlete, to become more flexible, to increase their mobility and also see their confidence increase. And it'll come out on the field, diamond court or track. You know, one of one of the things that I wanted to get into, Sean, is, you know, what are the strength training guidelines when it comes to training female athletes? OK, um, so when I spoke earlier, um, again, there's really no no separate one for male or female. They, they bleed together where there's some things you want to pay attention to when you're training a female. Um, first and foremost, uh, you want a program that's going to uh, enhance their athletic performance. Bottom line. Uh, uh, you, you, you definitely, you want to know where you're starting from. So, uh, the first point 
could go for, you know, when training a, a male athlete is, you know, as, as well, um, you want to train for power. You want them training for strength, agility. And so, uh, one thing you want to make sure you, you want to know where you're starting. So you have to have a, a good assessment tool. And, um, one of the tools we use is the functional movement screen, which tests flexibility, stability, and mobility. And, uh, it's, it's really good assessment, um, uh, by uh, Greg Cook and Lee Burton. And so uh, another one is just looking at how they move. So another assessment is how they move. Uh, for instance, if I'm, um, you know, I want to look and see some jump training, uh, and I use a, a female athlete as an example. So if I ask her to squat down and jump and land, I want to see where her feet are, where her knees are, where her hips are, where her torso is. Uh in some of the cases that were of, of, of the female athletes I've trained, I've seen their knees collapse, which is 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 an is an issue, uh, a potential injury waiting to happen. So uh, that is an assessment that I that I see, and it tells me, okay, there's something we need to work on there. Uh, you know, if it's the posterior chain work or or glute hamstring work, anything like you know things like that. And so through that assessment, it gives us feedback on how to design. Uh, their, their program. Uh, definitely technique. Uh, always technique. Technique always trumps uh, any weight that you're trying to lift. Uh, I don't care how much weight you can lift, but if your technique is sloppy, I've done a poor job. And uh, and that's an, uh, unacceptable for me. So uh, until they get the technique down, there's no uh, moving, in, uh, increasing any weight. Uh, now, for female athletes, uh, uh, one thing uh, we do know is that their upper bodies aren't as strong as male athletes. So that is something we do want to uh, tap into. Also, uh, working the posterior chain is also important, uh, actually, for both uh, sexes, for athletes. But probably more in particular with female, because as, as humans, we're quad dominant. And then I'll, I'll talk about uh, another uh issue that's particular to female athletes, um, that would, um, help us m we'll want where we would want to focus on, on strengthening their posterior chain muscles and their core, uh, to, uh, avoid a, a, a potential injury issue. Um, and also we want multi, multi, multi-joint exercises. You just don't want to work, um, you know, one joint and, or any movement in, in one plane. You want every joint working, some working together. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing a single joint exercise, but a, for the most part, athletics involve multiple joints working at the same time. So you want a program that emphasizes that. Um, and, and, and those are some things that, uh, uh, guidelines that you want to consider when training a male or female athlete. But as I, uh, pointed out, there are a couple of things, uh, you want to pay uh, particular attention to when uh, training female athletes. Yeah. You know, so if, if you're a sports parent or young coach listening to this, you, you want to put your daughter or your girls in a position to where, you know, from a guideline standpoint, you want them around a, a strength coach, a personal trainer, a, perm, a performance enhancement specialist, somebody that's going to do a uh, start off with an assessment. And that assessment is going to assess mobility, flexibility and general strength. And and then and it, it will uncover any asymmetries because they're all there tend to be balance issues. So once we find those asymmetries, we can work on work on those and become more symmetrical, depending on if if it if, if it's a shoulder asymmetry, a hip asymmetry or an ankle, you know, um, you know, mobility restriction or what have you. Ne nevertheless, then we can get into the strength training and the power training and then later like the jump training and things like that and getting and getting more dynamic. But the program has to start with an assessment. You have to you want your kids around somebody that takes technique and biomechanics into consideration. And that's always front front of mind. You know, Sean, I wanted to ask you, is the female strength training program different from that of males? And generally, no, it's not different. Um, as I mentioned earlier, everybody wants, I mean, you want your athlete to be powerful, uh, stronger, more agile, more mobility. 
uh, one thing that you do want to, uh, I'll mention a couple of things that you want to make, uh, um, focus on, uh, with women. Uh, it's, um, their posterior chain, uh, musculature, uh, and also their upper body strength. Cause in general, generally, um, you know, females aren't as, uh, as strong in the upper body uh, as as uh, as the males, you know, due to their, the cross section of the muscles and just the uh, you know the hormones that we have, our testosterone, which gives us the bigger muscles. Uh, as as I alluded to, female bodybuilders who who <laughs> engage in that. Uh, so with males, our bodies, our upper bodies are stronger. So it will be known that uh, in general terms. Your female athlete would lack upper body strength. Uh, but I don't know how many people know this, but, you know, basically pound for pound, women's lower bodies, uh, musculature is just as strong as males. So that is not a huge issue. But what the issue is, is, is their Q angle. And the Q angle measurement is the angle between the quadriceps muscle and the patellar tendon. And for females, uh, due to their, their wider hips, uh, because, uh, you know, for birth purposes and that's how they're made, they have a greater Q angle than, um, than males, uh, males in general have a 14 degree Q angle and women have a 17 degree. Now, if you start to look at some other, um, some other structures. So if we're looking at, uh, uh, as, you know, the, the knee as it is, if it's normal, as opposed to somebody who's knock need. So if you're knock need, then your Q angle increases that much more. And and this angle, what it does is it causes a, a, a maltracking of the patella. So and what that does, it can start wearing out the back end of the patella. So um, when you, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but when you're looking at someone with a, a Q angle and it's increased due to some other structure, then you that tells as a strength coach, you have to be aware. And this is what, as you mentioned earlier, this is why it's so important that parents just don't trust their kid to anyone. You want to make sure somebody that is aware of that and they know how to address it. So that, so when you uh, have somebody with this, these, uh, these structural uh, deficiencies, uh, you want to address that. So what we do is uh, work the posterior chain musculature of the, the glutes, uh, the hamstring, the calves. Uh, it may even take something like doing a lot of a lot more flexibility training, uh, uh, loosening up that the IT band. And the IT band is the iliotibial, t- il- iliotibial band on the side of the leg that goes from the hip down into the knee. So that is the IT band. And sometimes uh, when that muscle is tight, it can cause some patella tracking issues as well. When you're looking at a strength training program, if you're comparing the sexes, uh, for females, you definitely want to lock in to really uh, emphasize the upper body strength. And you want to look at, uh, you know, posterior chain musculature, uh, because with this increased Q angle, uh, you know, uh, that puts a lot of stress on the ACL. And, and in our research, it shows that it's been shown that shown that uh, female athletes can experience a, experience ACL ruptures nine to 10 times more likely than males. So if they're nine times more likely, then it would be incumbent upon us as strength coaches to really, um, through our assessment and just in general terms, to work on um, uh, those musculatures and and their core strength and do the things that can uh, decrease that, that likelihood of an injury occurring. You know, alluding to what you said earlier, that uh, females, it w- it would behoove them, you know, the young athlete and them doing strength training, it would behoove them to be participating in multi-joint movements. And I know sometimes in in the wrong settings or with the wrong instructor or coach, that could be a problem, you know, and my philosophy has always been to start an athlete doing multi-joint movements with their own body weight, you know, and then maybe progressively going to a PVC pipe 
And then we might even do some things that are multi-joint with resistance bands. Yes. And then once I get, once we, I'm comfortable, they're comfortable, they're working around a- other athletes that can do a little bit more than they can. And they start to see progression to get confidence, you know, for, especially what you're talking about doing any kind of bending or squatting movement and even pressing, you know, making sure like the knees are in the right position, the shoulders are in the right position. Then I can go to maybe a 10 pound or a 15 15 pound training bar. And then I've seen them progress, you know, to a 45 pound universal bar. What can be done to make strength training more acceptable with female athletes? I know, you know, we, there's, there's education, there's talking to parents. How how do we get through, you know, with education, talking to the parents and the coaches? Well, one thing is, is, uh, programs like this, you know, through sports mastery, you know, the, the, the information we're, we're given, uh, you know, we put that out there with the information and it's just not based on what we think, but actually some solid evidence, um, you know, peer reviewed, uh, research, uh, that helps, uh, you know, uh, I always joke with my friends and I'm always carrying around my my strength training soapbox and I'm, I'm ready to put it down anytime. And, uh, and that's what it's going to take. Uh, because as you, as you see, we have to undo a lot of years of just misinformation and you, you can't blame the parents because if they're, they're hearing this and they're not in the field as we are, then that's just going to be there. Uh, you know, that's where they're going to get their information. So it's up to us to um, to come combat that by giving them more information more frequently, uh, not only give them the information, uh, you know, speaking at um, parent teacher meetings or going to youth football clinics uh, or, or female, um, you know, sports uh, teams and talking about this. Uh, so, um, you know, or giving presentations at, at conferences or sending information out. So as much information as they've received about the, you know, the, the negative aspects of, of, of strength training, uh, we have to be a lot more proactive in getting that information out, showing them that, yes, it's OK. Uh, you know, your daughter's not going to end up looking like a man, not going to be muscle bound and, and all that stuff. So, you know, we have to make sure that uh, we get the information out. And not only that, we have some great examples uh you know, just looking at uh, uh, women in sports today, as I mentioned earlier, Serena Williams. Uh, I mean, you can point to her. See, look how powerful she's hitting that ball. That just didn't come because she just stepped on the court. You know, she's doing things right. in the lab. Um, you know, I, I remember some years ago when um, uh, the UConn women basketball team came to UOP. And when those young ladies stepped on the court, I was like, whoa. I just looked at just how they were built. Uh, I mean, they weren't, weren't, they didn't look like some bodybuilders, but they were well built and the way they moved. I mean, some of the, when they were defending, they were sliding laterally just as fast as the uh, UOP uh, basketball player was dribbling forward. And, and I was, I was so impressed. I, I, I kept elbowing my buddies like, man, look at these girls. Look at, look at how they're moving. I mean, when they would go for a rebound, they come down there, spring right back up. And it, it was just no contest. I mean, they were just, and, and, and as a strength coach, I knew that that was because they were in the weight room. Somebody was working with them. Uh, they, they were, they, they were all in on that program and it was obvious. And so when we have examples like that, uh, you know, uh, or other 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 women in sports or other sports teams, it's easy to point to the parent or the female athlete. You say, "Look, those are what those girls are doing. What do you think is going to happen when you go to college? You're just not going to play sports. You're going to have to check into the weight room and work with the strength coach. So you you're better off being introduced to it now, getting the technique now, being around a coach and learning the lingo now, as opposed to, you know, if you go to college and all of a sudden it's time to lift and you don't know what's going on. You're, you're starting behind the eight ball where somebody else who's been introduced to a, a strength training program, they're ready to go. And so that could be a difference between uh plan or sitting the bench. So uh, it's all those things combined. 
uh, that that that's going to make it a lot more acceptable. I think it, we've done a great job in getting it more uh, getting it acceptable, but you know, in some of the high schools uh, levels I've worked at, is still some hesitation with it. Yes, you know, uh, if if you if you're listening to this, it's like like what Sean said before. We're here to bring you concise and sound and research based information, and then also share our practical experience with you. You know, um, if you get a chance, head over to uh, Sports Mastery on iTunes. Give us a rating. Give us a review. You know, this will help us in the iTunes rankings, and you know, uh, I would very much appreciate that. You know, one one of the things that I would like to go into and discuss now is, you know, the importance of nutrition. And in my experience, especially with track and field athletes, working with the female athlete, you know, you, you start working with a kid, maybe they're 9, 10, 11 years old, and then they start to hit puberty. And they're fast before, and then it's time starts to decrease because now they're starting to grow breasts. Now, like you said, the hips start to widen. You know, it, it's one of the things that I found is that this is when strength training becomes important. But more importantly, this is when nutrition becomes important also. And we know that it's the fuel we need to optimally perform. What needs to be considered when addressing this topic with the female athlete? Well, you you have to be very careful uh, because they will listen or they may hear some things and it may not be what you're saying. I mean, for instance, if you're talking to one of the athletes and you're telling them about, you know, okay, strength training, develop your develop lean body mass. And then she may say, Oh, am I fat? <laughs> so now, you know, you you may be opening them up to eating disorders, which is 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 widely known that to occur. Uh, so, right, I, I would caution if you if you're a strength coach and you're you might want to consult with someone just to make sure if you if you're uncomfortable, uh, you know, talking nutrition with them. I mean, you want to make sure that you encourage them to eat because you need to fuel your performance. Uh, You don't want to restrict calories, even though there may be some, some athletes that may need to drop a few pounds. That is, you have to be very careful in your approach. Uh, So if, if you're not comfortable with it, you know, find someone who is because saying the wrong thing could, you know, lead to a downward spiral. Uh, you got to read it. And nutrition is important because, of, you know, the menstrual cycle and the bone density uh, issues that women have. So the thing is, you really want to talk to them about the importance of eating, why it's important to eat, uh, why it's important to eat the right things uh, and, and minimize some of the junk you want. It should all come from a, a sports performance aspect, not because, you know, the aesthetic aspect, how you look and things like that, because they may, again, do some, take some drastic measures. So you want to talk to them how important food is for them to, to, um, to perform and not make it, you know, a a bad thing. Uh, So that is, for me, that is the primary thing that I want to mention. And we can go into all how important protein is and, and, and carbohydrates and things like that. Uh, You know, But keep in mind when you're talking to them about nutrition that you really want to be careful uh, not to say the wrong thing, because then you're creating a whole different uh, issue uh, if that happens. You know, I I think that that's what separates uh, certain strength coaches, certain personal trainers, certain performance enhancement specialists is that. You, you you have to have a sense and understanding of emotional intelligence. And we talked about this on numerous occasions, but being able to listen for one and sometimes listening to the girls when they're just talking and speaking with each other. And like you said, being being mindful of what how you might interact verbally with your athlete, because we want to understand, you know, and figure out ways to discover what what is their relationship with food? How do they emotionally 
feel about food? How do they think about food when they're when they're stressed or depressed? You know, what are some of their behaviors? And oftentimes, you know, we live in a culture of comfort food. So, you know, people are going to eat. But like you said, if, if you're not comfortable, you know, going down, talking nutrition with an athlete, you definitely want to be careful. And this is like the, the the social intelligence part of it, too, because you can't have one without the other. You have to understand emotional intelligence and also social intelligence because you could say something to them and then they might go off and they might take it. They might take that offensive, yes. you know, or they might assume that you're saying that they're fat or something where we I mean, you what, what are some of the uh, eating disorders that you often discuss with the National Strength and Conditioning Association, Sean? You said, what, is it? what was that again? What are the eating disorders? What, 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 what are some of the eating, dis, uh, common eating disorders that are, that are often, that you often discuss with your oh, peers? Oh, the big two, you know, uh, obviously, is, uh, I won't say obviously, but uh, the, the ones that come to mind are anorexia and bulimia. Um, you know, uh, you know, when some people just don't want to eat uh, or, or when they eat and then they go and, and throw it up. Uh, that That's, that's, those are two uh, that everyone knows about. Um, and so, you know, if, if you, if, uh, you're not, um, well, um, informed about those, then maybe some you want to read, uh, read on or, or talk with a school nutritionist or start talking to a nutritionist or a registered dietitian about that. Uh, cause then there, there are some signs that, that you can recognize, uh, you know, when people are at the table and they're just pushing their food around, or they don't like to eat around other people, uh, so there there are some signs that that that, that can be um, uh, that you can pick up and and, uh, and see if there's an issue, and then now then when you pick those signs up, then on how you, how how to address them. Uh, so um, those are the two: uh, anorexia and, and bulimic. Yeah, those are the two uh, primary ones. What are some of the common psychological aspects to consider when training female athletes? Uh, well, when you come to psychological, you've got to remember that they're not men. <laughs> they're not the male athletes. So, uh, yes, you can get in, you can dig into them. Uh, you know, they, they just like we, we, we've talked to on previous uh, on podcasts, it's all about getting to know your athlete. Uh, so some, some, some females, you can lean into them. I mean, you can lean into them and, and give them the business and, and, and really, um, you know, you know, be a little rough, I guess you could say, uh, cause they can handle it. Some can't, you know, some, some can't. And you as a, as a strength coach or as a coach, you need to know how to approach them and the best way to reach them. Um, you know, you, you just got to make sure that you get to know your athlete, um, you can't always, you know, tear them down, and 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 really that 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 can go with a male athlete or a female athlete. Uh, but but with that that question, I think the best thing to do is get to know your athlete, get to know where they came from, get to know what makes them tick, get to know what their likes or dislikes, what what do they do in their spare time, you know, what's their family life like, what's their relationship with their parents, what's the relationship with their brothers and sisters and that that can give you a, a great great window into who they are and then you would know how to operate you know you would know what buttons to push to get them to uh that next level uh, that you both are seeking you know uh, because i can go uh with one athlete and, and approach her this way i can't do that with the other one because they're different people so i need to know you know, which, uh, which, which, which method to use, just like, uh, in the book, conscious, Co conscious coaching by Brett Bartholomew. Um, it's, it's the same thing. Get to know your athletes, you know, what type of athlete they are. The Sports Mastery Workbook was created for the student athlete and the parent to work through together. The Sports Mastery Workbook was created for the student athlete and the coach to work through together. It was created in a sense and in a way to bridge the gap in communication between these parties and build a successful relationship dynamic.
To learn more, visit sportsmastery.com forward slash workbook or check out the show notes page and click on the link.